This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. We are the first peoples of the Americas. We have been here from the beginning. Our ancestors navigated by the wind and stars, crossing vast oceans and mountain ranges, searching for new lands. Over thousands of years, our ancestors became astronomers and architects, philosophers and scientists, artists and inventors. We created distinct societies and built vast trade systems that covered two continents. In 1492, our world was changed forever, but we did not disappear. Today, the languages and teachings of our ancestors remain. And these are the untold stories of the Americas before Columbus. We've been taught that the Western Hemisphere before 1491 was a sparsely populated wilderness virtually untouched by humans. But this pristine world was nothing more than a myth. In reality, there were millions of indigenous people living throughout the Americas, and the majority lived in large cities and towns. To provide for these large urban centers, innovative techniques were invented to modify and manipulate the environment. Our ancestors used fire to clear the land, they constructed canals that turned deserts into productive farmland. They built terraces on steep mountainsides to grow crops. And in Amazonia, they manufactured a soil so fertile, it transformed an entire ecosystem. These impressive modifications to the environment were driven not only by the needs of a growing population, but by an ancient respect and connection to the land and water. Like a lot of indigenous metaphors, uh, convey whole bodies of thought and philosophy and understanding. And this is many times not captured in uh, an anthropological record or a archeological record or a historical record, uh, because this, this is really the thoughts that guide the people. We have relationships to water, which is the most basic elemental relationship because water is life, you know, in all cultures, in all traditions. And so we have a lot of metaphors that uh, reflect and that represent and that symbolize uh, water in all of its various uh, stages from, from uh, water sitting in, in, a, in a lake or a pond or, or moving in a stream or a river to water that is cycling in clouds and coming down as rain and snow. And so all of those uh, forms of water uh, are sacred in the context of indigenous thinking. Covering an area as large as the continental United States, Amazonia holds 10% of the world's plants, birds, animals, and insects. It also had an indigenous population that numbered in the millions in 1491. So that idea that the Amazon is a tropical, pristine rainforest is probably very recent. Rainforests grow up on the top of places that used to be settled before. If you could go back a thousand years ago, we would see a different landscape than we see today. About 2% of the land lies within the floodplain of the Amazon River and its many branches. And the soil here is fertile. The Amazon comes from the Andes, brings lots of like uh, nutrients with its waters, and then it floods every year. It brings nutrients to the floodplains. So these soils are very rich. But the majority of the soil in Amazonia is too acidic for extensive agricultural use. Normally, Amazon soils are not very rich. They're very acidic. The pH is not very good. Tropical soil, very fast, will lose its fertility because of rain, leaching. In the places where the land was less fertile, indigenous people engineered a soil called terra preta, or dark earth. 
Made from broken pottery, plant waste, fish bones, and charcoal, terra preta has been found in village sites that date back 7,000 years, about the time that pottery was first produced in the Amazon. In Guyana, they go back to 5,000 years, even more. In, in, in southern Amazon, they go back to 7,000 years. What's interesting, though, is the terra preta, if, if the idea that they're used for farming, for improving the conditions, natural conditions of the soils, were valid. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From uncovering ancient Neolithic cultures to the dawn of the space race, History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. And it's not just documentaries either. We have a network of incredible history podcasts bringing you new episodes every day. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. Traditional knowledge of farming, plant cultivation and soil management is passed down from generation to generation among indigenous people. Terra Preta has been found throughout the upland areas of Amazonia, often far away from rivers. Developing a way to make these soils fertile and productive for agroforestry was a matter of survival. But the abundance of terra preta soils next to village sites that were already in fertile areas has raised many questions about its origins. It's interesting because we're finding also terra preta soils in areas which are very fertile. <laughs> <laughs> the essential ingredient in terra preta is charcoal. The people who made this soil used a slash and char method to create the charcoal. This causes less carbon emissions and produces a more stable product than slash and burn. <laughs> And these terra preta soils are very productive. They're really, really rich and productive soils. They allow one to cultivate in the same spot for many years. Some of these orchards or this, you know, managed forests, there was no need for farming. Those are very highly productive environments. That entails a different relationship with people and their surrounding landscape. Villages were often situated in rings, and while the center of such a ring would be barren, on the outskirts of each village were middens where food waste was deposited. The people who developed and used this rich soil were not farmers in the traditional sense, but horticulturalists. They simultaneously cultivated domesticated and wild vegetables, fruit, grains, and trees. The terra preta soil found in these villages may not have been intentionally manufactured in the same way as the upland sites. It may simply be the result of thousands of years of man-made organic waste. One would expect to find those soils away from the settlement areas. But what we do find is that in most cases, the sites, this, this, the soils are in the very same place 
where people used to live. In order to live well in the Amazon, one has to really be aware of the wealth of information, and it takes really very sophisticated societies. The ancient Amazonians discovered a way to sustain a growing population despite having acidic soils in much of their territories. The ability to engineer the soil to meet the needs of the people is one of the most significant environmental achievements of our ancestors. Throughout North America, indigenous people depended on access to hunting grounds as well as distant communities for trade. It's quite clear that people used to travel very, very long distances. It seems incredibly difficult, but people knew how to travel back then. Communities were often hundreds of kilometers apart, with forests, mountains, and prairies in between. Finding consistent and predictable routes of travel year-round was a necessity. The answer was a natural highway system embedded in the surrounding environment. Whether flowing in summer or frozen solid in winter, the rivers of North America were a dependable transportation route for indigenous people. The Dene people could travel thousands of kilometers on frozen rivers because they had such highly developed snowshoe technology. Traditional Dene snowshoes are still better than uh, commercial snowshoes in many ways. They're designed for your feet. They're designed to deal with um, the exigencies of the climate in your region. You pick particular uh, uh, wood and sinew for them. They're sewn in different ways so that they adapt to different snow conditions. And you might carry more than one pair for different kinds of snow. And then, of course, in, in the summer, traveling thousands of kilometers along many of our huge rivers, the Mississippi, the Yukon, the Mackenzie, these rivers are enormously long, and you can travel on them quite easily throughout most of the year. The preferred vessel for transportation along North American waterways and coastlines was the canoe. The canoe was always central because we were marine-based people. That, the, the rivers and the oceans were our highways. So we needed the canoe. So we became very skilled canoe makers. To adapt to the stormy weather and strong currents of the Pacific Ocean, the peoples of Northwest North America carved heavier canoes from cedar. If we know how the waters are here in the Northwest coast, you could lose yourself out there. While some coastal vessels were smaller and more suited for shoreline fishing, Others were ocean-going canoes carved from massive logs that required exceptional craftsmanship to build. They had various types of canoes depending on what duty it served or what purpose it served. So you'd have canoes for traveling to potlatches, canoes for, for gathering foods and medicines and plants, canoes for warring, canoes for whaling, canoes for fishing. And so you had various types of canoes that were carved for a specific purpose. So variations to that canoe existed. Inland water travel required a different style of boat. Using the same basic vessel, the canoes of indigenous people living inland were smaller and lighter to accommodate long stretches of river or lake travel. These canoes were typically constructed from the barks of trees. Sturdy enough to withstand river rapids, birch bark canoes were also light enough to portage or carry long distances between waterways. People thought nothing of um, packing up with anything that they could carry and then going off for six months or a year to go travel. Um, to go visit uh, distant, distant relatives or just to go explore. There's absolutely no question that people would get around all over, all the time. Man-made earthworks created an artificial topography throughout North America before 1491. These mound structures were built over thousands of years. One of the largest concentrations is located on the Mississippi River near present-day St. Louis. The ancient city of Cahokia had 120 mounds with the largest known as Monk's Mound. This massive earthwork covered five and a half hectares and was 30 meters high. To construct this mound, thousands of workers carried more than a million square meters of earth in woven bags to the site. 
for my own tribe, we have a story about a mound site in Mississippi called Naniwaya, and we came up from from below. We came up um, out of that mound, according to one story, or we followed uh, two brothers, um, Chata and Chiksa, uh, from the west. Uh, we came, we traveled east, and um, finally stopped at a place and, and built that mound, and we carried the bones of our ancestors with us and built the mound. Either story, it talks about this one place that's very significant in um, Choctaw tradition, and it places us in Mississippi, so it tells us where, how we came to be in that area. And the stories tell us about our relationship with other tribes, the, the Chickasaw and the Cherokee, among others. Um, the science actually fits in well with that if you think about people moving from the west into the east, and if you think about mound sites in the, um, the southeast that, that frequently function as burial mounds. So there are mounds that have human remains in them. Mounds are also part of the creation stories of indigenous peoples. A large concentration of ceremonial mounds are located throughout central and eastern North America. As family groups form societies and settled into villages and cities, the practice of burial mounds expanded. We can follow the evolution, if you will, of, of mound construction from 300 AD on up. We get small mounds, we get a little bit larger, we get mortuary mounds, we get mounds that have houses on top, so we can see an, an in situ development. Around 2,000 years ago, the mound building tradition intensified throughout the region and resulted in ceremonial centers along rivers and lakes. The mounds were spiritual gathering places where people would travel to make offerings and bury their family members and leaders. So we can recognize that at one point in time, there was a large group of people that probably all spoke the same language, all agreed to serve under whatever political structure was in place. And then after a time of stress, probably during the the, the little ice age in 12, 1300s, people started realizing that they could no longer exist within one large area that they had to, to pull apart again. But we also get some indications of influence from the South. The first pottery that occurs in North America is in Florida, and then it disappears. And then it comes again from in the Southwest and it moves across. But I think one of the important things is for North American tribal people to recognize that we, our cultures did develop in place, and whether we had some influence or not, these are North American cultures, and that we don't have to rely on someone from coming from somewhere else to help us move forward. Cultures throughout the world constructed earthen mounds for religious and ceremonial purposes. People would travel long distances to bury and honor their dead at these sites. The Kurgan people, who originated in the Black Sea region, buried their dead in deep shafts topped by mounds. The name Kurgan in Latvian means mound builder. Kofan are distinctive keyhole-shaped structures that were used as burial tombs in Japan. They range from several to 400 meters long. Thousands of burial mounds still exist throughout the Great Lakes region from the Hopewell era. Sacred objects and personal belongings were part of the burial ritual. In every part of the world, mounds and other man-made structures were used to honor the places where ancestors were buried. 
The steep mountainsides, high altitude, and cool climate of the Andes would seem a most inhospitable environment for humans to thrive, let alone agriculture. In looking at the American hemisphere, we are looking at a region that is highly mountainous, very fractured, part of what we call the neovolcanic axis. These regions of Bolivia and Peru have been home to successive indigenous societies over thousands of years. And the vertical topography didn't stop them from developing one of the most productive farming regions in the world. In places like Lake Titicaca and Sacred Valley of Peru, people began to sculpt the landscape into a series of stepped flat plateaus to make the mountainsides more accessible for agriculture. The same tendency occurred throughout the Americas, but perhaps the best known such terraces are those of groups like the Inca. They have terraces from the formative times. That is probably 1,000 years before Christ. By the time the Inca civilization came into existence 600 years ago, terraces already covered more than 1 million hectares of mountainous land in the Andean mountains. As the terraces became larger and more structured, laborers built them with expertly cut stone, sand, gravel, and soil. In some cases, you have the leveling of an area, uh, the soils are pushed away, and then agaves and other plants are planted along the, the boundary. And then, through the course of time, these become formal masonry structures. Those systems were among the most sophisticated, uh, I, would, I would contend, given that not only were these terraces often cut from stone that was easily fitted, and entire hillsides were terraced, but in order to prepare the terrace, soils were basically cleared, uh, the area was cut, and then gravel was placed in the basins of these terraced walls. The terrace's stone walls and multi-layered soil were designed to prevent the leaching of nutrients from the soil, retain heat during the cold mountain nights, and provide a natural gravity-fed watering system. This formed a kind of a, a, like a carbon filtration system in which clays and other soils and then rich soils for agriculture were placed over that and the entire terrace packed such that it could sustain crop year after year. We know that they are cultivating potatoes. And in some islands of the Titicaca Lake, they grown up corn. Also, they have uh, quinoa. Because of the nature of the clay soils in the region, uh, Peru, for instance, those soils uh, were almost impervious to erosion. So this allowed those terraces to be maintained through the course of centuries. And even today, many of the terraces built as much as a thousand years ago are still in use. By literally moving mountains, the Andean people of South America manipulated their environment to create one of the world's greatest engineering achievements. For thousands of years, farmers have been sculpting mountains and hillsides to create usable land to grow crops. Rice, potatoes, and yams are some of the grains and vegetables that are grown on terraced farmland. In Southeast Asia, 
farmers grew rice on terraces that were otherwise unusable hillsides. They used a system of ditches and canals to move rainwater between platforms. Pond fields were constructed on hillsides in Polynesia a thousand years ago. They were designed to produce larger yields of yams and taro for a growing population. Indigenous farmers first built terraces in the hilly terrain around Lake Titicaca more than 2,000 years ago. By the time the Inca farmers were working the land 600 years ago, there were 20,000 square kilometers of terraces in the Andean Mountains. Terraces offered farmers larger amounts of arable land, which in turn provided food to support the growing populations in nearby urban centers. During the long winter months, the Arctic region becomes an endless expanse of snow and ice. Further south in central North America, the prairie summer landscape is a never-ending sea of grass. With few naturally occurring landmarks to guide travelers and hunters, both environments can be daunting and even dangerous places to travel through. Ancient peoples have erected stone markers on the landscape for thousands of years. In North America, two of the most prominent stone structures are the Inukshuk in the Arctic and subarctic, and the Medicine Wheel on the Central Plains. A lot of the Inukshuks that we have have been there for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. The Inuktitut word Inukshuk means one that looks like a person. From Alaska to Greenland, these anthropomorphic stone structures have been built for more than 2,000 years. Inukshuks have many purposes, including keeping track of seal caught during hunting expeditions. If you catch a seal sometime in the summer, it sinks. And if you want to retrieve that seal and you don't have anything to retrieve it with, uh, you go ashore and you put up a couple of Inukshuks to point to exactly where the seal went down, you know, so uh, you can get back in that water and line up, you know, and you'll find your seal. And that's, um, you know, so we made the little ones just to point where, uh, you know, where our seal had gone down or some animal had gone down. Another purpose for an Inokshuk is to serve as a guiding landmark on the landscape. You grow up uh, living there, you know, and all these Inokshuks are everywhere. You get to recognize them, you know. They help you navigate out on the land. In 1973, we went on a canoe trip down the Ferguson River, and it's about 160 miles long. And um, at one point, we were completely lost. You know, we had two canoes and four people, and we're paddling around this huge lake that had twice as many islands as there were supposed to be. And by the end of the day, we had gone nowhere, you know, still looking for the way out. And so late in the evening, um, we decided we'd stop and, you know, spend the night and look for the way out the next day. So we saw an Inukshuk way off in the distance, and I said, let's go camp there. And so we paddled around all these islands, got up to the Inukshuk, and put up our camp, and before I turned in, I said, you know, I'm gonna look, go up there to the Inukshuk and take a look around. And um, so I climbed up and got, you know, stood beside the Inukshuk, and there was the river that we had been looking for all day. After that, every time we got lost, we would just find an Inukshuk on, on the horizon, and we would paddle, paddle there, and it led the way all the way out. And, that's why we navigated the, the Ferguson River. The Inukshuk is one of the most enduring symbols in the Arctic of ancient Inuit life. Found in various locations across the central plains of North America are low-lying man-made stone circles known as medicine wheels. Medicine wheels are enigmatic. They come in all shapes and sizes. 
Some of them are effigies of uh, turtles or uh, other animals. Some of them are effigies of humans. Uh, but what they all have uh, in common is uh, some relationship to the landscape. Medicine wheels had many possible purposes, such as ceremonial gathering places or as a place of cosmological alignment. Medicine wheels may also have had more practical uses. There has been some uh, attempt to try and find calendrical devices that astronomical alignments uh, from them. Myself, I'm skeptical of that area. In fact, I think the, uh, the better explanation is that they are geographical markers. Wherever we find medicine wheels, they are usually on a very prominent butte, so you have a good view of the surrounding landscape. But there are also areas where major rivers are easiest to cross, you know, like the Majorville Medicine Wheel is located right near Blackfoot Crossing. Uh, which is uh, the best place to cross the Bow River. Uh, and when people don't have bridges and when they have to uh, wade through the water, this is crucial knowledge. I think in, in actual fact that these, uh, what we call medicine wheels, are not so much uh, calendrical devices as they are mnemonic devices for the cognitive geography on the plains. One of the oldest stone structures in central North America is located in Blackfoot Nation territory in southern Alberta. At the center of the Majorville Medicine Wheel is a nine-meter central cairn connected by 28 stone spokes to an outer ring. People didn't just build this at one time. It was a slow accretion of uh, the central cairn and then also creating the outer rings and sometimes the spokes that joined the cairn and the outer ring. Besides being a significant geographical marker on the landscape, indigenous people traveled to Majorville for ceremonies and gatherings. Majorville Medicine Wheel, at the very bottom of the cairn, that the artifacts came from a time that is closer to 5,000 years ago. And they discovered uh, a lot of artifacts, like projectile points. But they also found other things like uh, phalanges, or finger bones of people. You know, and again, that was a very common thing where people would, uh, if somebody is grieving, they would cut off a, a tip of a finger and then leave that at the, at the medicine wheel. Recently, the University of Calgary wanted to repatriate those artifacts back to the Blackfoot community. Uh, but Blackfoot people say, no, we don't want those because when somebody left an artifact at the medicine wheel, they were leaving their troubles with that artifact. So if you come along and you take that artifact today, all you're doing is taking somebody else's troubles with you. They have ceremonial functions in that people go there to leave their troubles and make offerings, but they also serve as geographical markers when people are traveling across the prairies. As one of the oldest continually used ceremonial sites in the Americas, Majorville suggests that the Plains cultures were strongly rooted to a traditional homeland and continued to maintain their sacred gathering place for thousands of years. The ancestral Pueblo people have lived in southwest North America for more than 10,000 years. To survive in this semi-arid region with its seasonally high temperatures, it was crucial to find a way to control the rivers to irrigate land for farming and to provide a year-round supply of water for cooking and drinking. Given the requirements of living in this kind of uh, landscape, this kind of, of environment, uh, the essential uh, foundation uh, for uh, developing communities in uh, this area, because it's, uh, it is a desert, uh, was your access to water. Known for their multiple-story, multi-family adobe apartment complexes, the ancestral Pueblo were also master engineers when it came to manipulating and controlling the region's limited sources of water. Beginning about 1400 years ago, the agriculturally based peoples in the Phoenix Valley designed and built an advanced irrigation system of canals and reservoirs known as the Hohokam Canal. 
The main sources of water for the canals were rivers that originate in nearby mountain ranges. And the Salt River were the ones that delivered the water or brought the water. And it was through these irrigation canals that they were able to, of course, farm. The largest canal measured about six meters in depth and more than 20 meters wide. The longest canal was 32 kilometers long. The Hohokam Canal System irrigated more than 40,000 hectares of farmland. A great deal of physical effort, a great deal of planning, cooperation, and everybody had a common goal, and that was to achieve that, that uh, agricultural way of life. The Hohokam Canal really represent a application of uh, the communal mind in both uh, the construction of the canals and also the conceptualization of the canals. The essential way you survived, it was through the community and through participation in community work. It was a realization on the part of the community as a whole that these structures were necessary, again, to, to reach towards that goal of a good life through the production of food in ways that allowed for the people to grow, the communities to grow. The Hohokam Canal System that flowed from the Salt and Gila Rivers transformed the desert landscape and supported a prosperous, agriculturally-based society. It was as much an engineering achievement as it was a life-giving source of year-round water. Although a long drought likely forced the people in the Phoenix Valley to move, the footprint of this elaborate water system is still visible today. The Hohokam were one of many indigenous peoples in the Americas who developed sophisticated irrigation systems. In northern Peru, rivers flowing from the Andean Mountains brought water to the semi-arid Norte Chico Valley, where tens of thousands of people lived in cities between 4,000 and 5,500 years ago. Irrigation canals carried water to fields where cotton and food crops were grown. In Mesoamerica, the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan was built on a man-made island in Lake Texcoco. An intricate system of dikes, canals, and reservoirs were built. This supplied the hundreds of thousands of people in the city with fresh water for drinking, bathing, gardening, and fish farms. A few thousand years after humans started domesticating wild vegetables and grains, they began to devise ways to manage and divert water to irrigate fields and orchards. Irrigation and water control systems were common throughout the Indian subcontinent for thousands of years. In Sri Lanka, a massive artificial lake called Parakrama Samudra, built 1,600 years ago, is still in use today. One of the oldest irrigation systems in the world was built 6,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Rainwater and runoff from the mountains was caught and held in dams, then diverted to irrigate farmland. The Phoenix Valley was transformed from a desert into a highly productive agricultural region through the building of an 800-kilometer-long canal system that irrigated over 40,000 hectares of land. Canals, artificial lakes, and dams built thousands of years ago form the ancient footprint of irrigation systems still in use throughout the world today. Throughout the Americas, indigenous peoples extensively altered and manipulated the environment, sometimes changing entire ecosystems in the process. What we see in eastern woodlands is intensive modification of the landscape over thousands of years. Archaeological research has currently shown that the development of agriculture in that region occurred a lot earlier than previously believed. We are, as archaeologists, as researchers, just coming to realize and acknowledge how the land was shaped and formed. And we tend to call this anthropomorphic 
shaping of the landscape. 6,000 years ago, we do find the occurrence of stone tools that have been polished and shaped and have an edge. And we, can, we believe that they were used to chop down trees to clear the land. The earliest plant cultivation in the eastern woodlands of North America began about 4,000 years ago. Among the earliest crops were sunflowers, goosefoot, and squash. Later, maize, beans, and nuts were grown widely in eastern North America. People in the southeast ate fairly similar types of things. Uh, and then you move across and people live differently because um, you know, there are different cultures, different tribes, different communities. After the introduction of maize about 1,000 years ago, Eastern North America was transformed into a patchwork of agricultural fields and orchards. This intensive production of crops was the result of a new organizational structure for farming and better tools made from antler, bone, and stone. Throughout the eastern region, farmers cultivated a variety of nuts, including pecans, acorns, walnuts, and chestnuts. Forests were even designed and modified to attract animals for hunting. Eventually, they would plant the crops. They would create gardens. The gardens actually brought in animals that they could use for food. And so as they started creating these gardens, they did cut down the trees. They would open expanses up. They also used the, the trees for building. They built homes. They also used them for fires in the houses, for heating, for cooking, so they would open up landscapes. It was a new balance of nature and farming, completely manufactured by indigenous peoples. As people in many parts of the world began leaving behind a hunter-gatherer lifestyle in favor of farming, it became necessary to clear land. This led to the development of cultivated farmland in areas that were once forests and wild grasslands. Around 10,000 years ago in the Middle East, people progressed from harvesting wild grains and hunting to cultivating wheat and barley and domesticating livestock. This change to a farming lifestyle ensured a supply of food throughout the year and led to the establishment of permanent villages. Broom corn and foxtail millet were first domesticated in northern China 6,000 years ago. In southern and central China, one of the first domesticated crops was rice. Indigenous people in eastern North America have been cultivating plants and grains for thousands of years. To grow three of the most important crops, maize, beans, and squash, they cleared vast areas of forests using fires and tools. As hunter-gatherers started domesticating animals and growing annual crops, farming villages appeared. Permanent settlements required an ever-increasing agricultural land base, and this led to larger urban centers. As communities in North America became larger and more centralized, the need for stable food sources increased. This led to man-made changes to the landscape to open up land for agricultural and hunting purposes. An expedient way to manage the landscape was to carry out controlled burns. Fire is like indispensable and, and I really, you know, I, I think this goes right back to when our ancient ancestors first discovered fire and how useful it was. In several parts of North America, indigenous people used fire, one, to clear land, to create agricultural plots, and of course, burning of that landscape enhanced the soil for a certain amount of time. On the west side of the continent, people literally burnt parts of the forest. And what this did was encourage other kinds of plants to grow, notably berries, which could also be mass harvested to support large populations. 
On the central plains, grasslands were cleared with fire to encourage new plant growth in the spring. This in turn attracted large herd animals like buffalo. Fire was also used to drive buffalo to certain hunting locations. When Blackfoot people were uh, preparing a buffalo jump, they knew in advance where they were going to hold their buffalo jump. So they would send somebody there in the fall time to burn the grass in the gathering basin. And by burning the grass, you put the seeds back into the ground, but also you give a little bit of uh, fertilizer with the ash. So in the springtime, that's where the grass is going to be greenest first. And so that's going to attract grazing animals like bison. A buffalo jump didn't just happen. It was very purposeful, you know, people uh, created the conditions that would ensure a success. Controlled burns generated higher yields for farmers and hunters and brought about significant changes to the natural ecosystem. Indigenous peoples before 1491 impacted the natural environment through agriculture, earthworks, urban development, water management, controlled burning, and deforestation. These were innovations that were driven by the need to provide food, clothing, and shelter for a constantly growing population in the Americas. All of these adaptations created an artificial landscape and had a profound effect on the climate, soil, water, and wildlife in the Americas. Today, we have a powerful tradition of land stewardship that evolved from these ancient technologies.